Imagine this, it's April 2020. You already know what happened in 2020 in April, so nobody needs to go into details. It's one year since you've opened the doors to your gym and you're down to $70 after all the things that happened in April 2020 allowed your gym to go down to that few members per month. Fast forward one year later, $106,000 in monthly revenue. That's what Sean Wardle and his team at D1 Boise have been able to pull together and do uh, at their studio in just one year. And honestly, I, I would even say since uh, the catastrophe that happened in 2020, but really since you were down to $70 because the catastrophe went on for longer than just April. Oh, yeah. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Sean, welcome to the GSE show. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So you're the owner of D1 Boise. Correct. D1 Training Boise. And and you've been in the fitness industry for a while. My whole life. Your whole life, right? And you're, you're young. So it's not that long, but it's long enough to say your whole life. How long? <laughs> uh, so I'm actually a third generation health and fitness operator. Okay. So my grandmother uh, worked in European health spa and then family fitness in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and my parents started a gym in the, in the 70s. Okay. I got my first job in the gym when I was 10 years old. Uh, <sighs> I got 25 cents to scrub the men's toilet. Okay. I imagine that in the 1980s bodybuilder era. Yeah. Oh, as a toilet, huh? It was a, it was a wonderful toilet. Okay. So that's, so that's where I started uh, the business, and I got my first personal training certification when I was 16. And then, um, yeah. The it just went from there. Yeah. So, so this, uh, this concept is different than what you've done, though, because you came from more of like a big box, more of like an all-inclusive type of club. And D1 training um, is, is really more of a class base. You do have the option for people to come in and work out too, but there's like sessions that you go into and there's an instructor leading that particular class, basically a class-based program predominantly, correct? Yep. Yep. Um, for those, for those uh, the people that are listening in and, and don't know because it's not in their area, just break down D1 training overall. What is it and, and how does it work? So D1 training is, a, we call it the place for the athlete, right? And we, and we identify an athlete as anybody that's committed to their sport or fitness. And so um, we're a class-based, um, as well as small group and personal training. And one of the unique things that we do is we have a scholastic program. So we have our youth-based athletes that we start at seven years old. Oh. Um, and, and one of the really cool things that attracted me to this brand is you've got um, these, these kids that are, this isn't PE, they're getting after it and they get their own coach. They come in, they get their own coach, they're on the turf, they're working, right? Now mm -hmm. we have some fun too, um, yeah. but we're teaching them how to be athletes and how to go on a whistle. Um, and they're right there next to their parents, which, yeah. is, which is really cool. And you guys have turf. Can we show the turf, Maketa? Show some B-roll of the turf? Because we actually went out and visited you guys back, uh, was that January, February, March? Something around there, this yeah. year, 2021. Yep. And uh, it's blue turf, which is really cool. But some D1s have basketball courts as well, correct? Yeah, a couple of them do, um, basketball courts. And um, the model is actually really shrinking, right? Okay. So um, my, my, my D1 is one of the smaller ones when we opened up. Right? Okay. Some, some of them, uh, we call it the Nashville, the original Nashville, the cathedral, right? And it's over 20,000 square feet. Um, and my fitness floor is only 7,000 square feet. Yeah. And the model is now is continuing to shrink as, as we're doing more group-based classes. How many people do you fit in a class? Uh, we have a cap of 28 in a class. 28 in a class. So it's, 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 not a, it's not like you fit in 50, 60, 70 people in a class. So you were down to seventy dollars. Is that right? <laughs> seventy dollars. It was. How did that? How did that feel? What, what? What? What was the moment like? Did you check your bank accounts? All seventy dollars? You just knew because you know your numbers. What? What happened? So here's what happened. So April fourth, I'll never forget the day. And I'm I'm sitting I'm sitting at home, in my house because the governor of Idaho had decided that it was too dangerous for me to go to my business. Okay. So I'm at home and I had just made payroll. That's what happened, right? So we didn't we didn't draft dues for April. Okay. We were shut down in March and we made the business decision that we weren't going to charge our members if we couldn't provide them service. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I owed the staff that I, that, that worked in March. Um, I kept my manager on, paid him his salary and that's when we ended up with $70. $70. So what was that feeling like? Cause you had it, cause you already knew that you weren't charging people and payroll was coming up again. So what was that feeling? Well, I looked at my wife, and so and the other thing is, is we had celebrated uh, 
we opened April 1st of 2019. So I got to celebrate our one year anniversary closed. Wow. And, uh, and we made payroll on the fourth and I looked at my wife and I said, well, that was a good run. <laughs> and, and I, I, I'll be honest with you. I'm, I, I have never given up on anything and, and I, and I didn't give up there, but I really wanted to. How did you get out of it? How did you go from $70 to for, forget 106,000 per month? How did you get from $70 to, you know, 20,000 enough to make payroll enough to be able to pay your stuff? So, um, I had a lot of time on my hands right? As you can imagine. And so one of the things that I looked at um, was what was available to small businesses. And so I became, um, uh, in my opinion, a subject matter expert on the PPP program. I think a lot did. A lot. <laughs> I, I, I was a wizard. <laughs> okay, so and, I got it. And one of, the, one of the other challenges that I had, so um, we bank with, the, with a small community bank that was purchased by a, a, a larger conglomerate. Um, and that had happened just prior to April. Mm -hmm. And so I got to meet my new business banker in the middle of this. Wow. Um, and, and Mike was great to work with, but he was very honest with me in the sense that he said, ah, we don't really have any idea what's going on. None of them did. It, it, the rules were changing almost daily. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So we ended, we ended up uh, right before um, we needed to do payroll again. We ended up um, uh, getting a PPP loan. And, and we took that. And we decided that we were going to we were going to go, and we were going to do what we could do. We did online classes for our people. We checked in with them daily. We were constantly um, in communication with them, and and our members really appreciated that. Yeah. Um, and and we were again cognizant of the fact that we couldn't bring them in uh, to be part of that community, but we kept them intact, and we ended up retaining about forty percent. Wow. That's honestly that's not bad. <laughs> That's not bad. I mean, a lot of people went down to almost, I'm honestly, a lot of people went out of business. Right. I think ha more than half of the gyms and facilities went out of business in, in 2020. So to keeping 30%, 40% is, is not too bad. Uh, obviously, it's not great, but it's not too bad. So so now you guys were at 40%. Now, just so you guys know, everyone listening, everyone watching, Sean's one of the smartest guys I've met in the space, very experienced. So we're going to get into some tactic stuff that happened even afterwards because your door is finally open to when? When, when were you able to be a normal gym? Uh, minus capacity stuff. Sure. So, uh, so we we actually again back to sort of the the government restrictions. Watch those very closely. Um, Idaho said May first we could open for youth sports. So we opened just for our scholastic athletes, right? Which, by the way, had been one of our challenges. Honestly, we we had more adults than we did kids, and we took that as an opportunity to invite those kids in. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, by the way, that the parents were. They had kids cooped up for over two months. <laughs> they were ready to go. Yeah, and, and we limited our class size to fifteen. Um, we had, you know, we had um, extra cleaning. I mean, we did everything right, mm -hmm. and people flocked to the gym. That's awesome. And so for fifteen days, the kids had the run of the gym by themselves, and they loved it. That's great. Okay, so now you're at one hundred and six thousand. How does that stand? in the franchise as a whole? Because D1's a franchise. So is that top 5%, top 10%, top 20%? I mean, how does that, how does that rank? Yeah, top 5%. Top 5%. So, yep. so you're, you're one of the guys that should be here talking. That's what we look for. So at $106,000 per month, um, you know, how many members does that equate to? And what are, what are the, the things that you feel um, have separated you from other, not just D1s, but other facilities in the, in the world that aren't struggling to even, honestly, a lot of them break, have a hard time breaking 30 or 40,000 a month. Sure. Some of the really good ones are having a hard time breaking 50 to 70 a month. You're obviously at 106. So talk to me more about that. So um, when we came into this, first off, a little bit about, you know, big box experience, right? So um, spent a lot of time in that world and then sold my clubs to Crunch. And, and I said, if I was ever going to get back in fitness, I was going to go completely the other direction, right? Mm -hmm. Go the extreme. And, and I really feel like D1 is that kind of extreme. It's the antithesis of, of the big box. Right. Right. And prior to, you know, things happening last year, 85% of our members had a membership to a big box gym. Right. But they came to us for their specific goal orientation and, and to get after it. Mm -hmm. And so our goal was always to be at over $200 per member in terms of services in addition to, to membership. Mm -hmm. And that's where, um, and that's where we've, we've pushed. Right. So we're at about 450 members now. Um, and we're doing a little over 60,000 in ancillary revenue, right? So training revenue. Wow. Yeah. 
Yeah. Wow. So that's really what helps push you over the edge. Absolutely. A lot of people don't pay a lot of t attention to ancillary sales. Um, they see it as like a bonus, but it's really, it's a, it's a very important stream. It usually carries the best margins. Um, you know, in, in the in the world uh, of a franchise especially, but even, let's take out of fitness for a second. McDonald's, I, I can't remember the exact margin, but I think they, they either take a loss or it's very small percentages on most of their burgers where they make most of the margins on the fries, the sodas, the shake, right? And the desserts and stuff like that, the ice cream. So the would you like fries with that? It's a very important question. Oh, yeah. And they've tested six different ways. I, I read uh, through the, I think this is the book, The Ultimate Sales Machine by Chet Holmes. And they talked about McDonald's. They tested six different ways across thousands of locations to see which one converts the most into fries being added to the meal. And then Biggie Size came in and all those other things. So for you, ancillary sales, you've realized that this isn't a bonus. This is, uh, this is probably even more important than the recurring revenue. The recurring revenue is the entry to really where the, the real money is. Yep. yep. So, so let's talk about the, uh, the members that you get in. Because right now, you've got, you've got an in incredible studio manager uh, in Tanner, uh, Tanner Lowry. I'm going to say his name because he deserves it. He's, <laughs> he's, 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 he's a great. solid guy. Um, very smart guy, but he was very green. Um, you know, when you had brought him in on board, even when I had met him, I'm like, man, this guy, what he's got going for him more than anything is he's hungry as hell and he's smart as hell. Um, but he was green. He didn't have 20 years experience or 10 years experience in the space, right? Did he do anything like this before? Yeah. So he was, he was actually with a, with a D1, um, and worked in the personal training department, interned there, uh, while he was going to school at Baylor. A trainer though, not a manager. Right. This uh, yeah. It's, so green, he's never managed like this before. Right. So... That's not easy, you know. No, the the one the one thing that, and, and if he were here, I think he'd tell you is that that uh, I told him just like I'll tell anybody in the fitness world, the only thing that matters in this business is people. Mm -hmm. That's it. There's just one thing that matters, and 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 I'll be honest with you, Tanner and I had that conversation a lot, um, and and you ask, you know, what what steps have we taken to get where we are today? It's all our people. So elaborate on that. What, 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 did, what do you want Tanner to think about when you tell him that? So um, he's got to commit to his people, right? And, and that means a couple different things. The first thing that I told him, and, and by the way, he didn't believe me, is I always told him, I said, Tanner, I will never ever set a goal for you that you can achieve by yourself. And he's good. He's a great, great salesperson, but I wasn't kidding. I have never set a goal for him that he could achieve by himself. So he's got to have that team around him. Um, and by the way, we create the one thing about D1 that that is that is very unique, um, and I like. I can bring my specialty to it. Is a lot of studio owners think they're going to go pick up a, a, a personal trainer or or someone from another that has industry experience, mm -hmm. right? And they're going to bring them in and they're going to give them this great studio and they're going to just thrive or they're going to bring their clients over. Right. We have two or three trainers that have trained outside before out of our 23 staff. Wow. We have created an environment where they can be successful. And I'll give you, I'll give you an example. So I have, two, I have two individuals that a year ago had never done a personal training or a team training session and had never sold any of that. Both did over $10,000 last month. Wow. So, so obviously you put them through some training. We do. And again, back to that commitment level. So that's where, that's where Tanner has really shined in the sense that he is now committing not just to their education, but to fully immerse himself in their success mm -hmm. because their success is our success. And, and I mean that from the very beginning, not just sales, right? I mean, sales is important. Teaching people how to sell mm -hmm. and how to retain is extremely important, but showing them how to develop clients, helping them progress their people and results. Because by the way, we can be the greatest salespeople in the world, but if we don't get results for our people, we're going to be doing 50 grand next month. Yeah. So a lot of people have a hard time finding great managers um, and great trainers, great front desk people, honestly, people in general, a lot of people struggle with finding. And I'm going to say something really quick that when Tanner sees this or listens, because I know he, he's, a, he's a fan of the show. The first instinct is going to be like, oh, that sounds kind of hurtful, but I want him to hear it the way it's meant to be heard. Okay. Tanner's not the only Tanner. There's a lot of Tanners out there. However, 
I don't mean that in the full holistic way. Tanner's a very special guy on a personal level. I really think he's got a lot going for personally. But on the business side, even Tanner has to believe there's a lot of Tanners out there because as a leader, his job is to continue to de- multiply himself and develop leaders. If he can't create another Tanner, well, then scaling to four, five, 10, 15 locations, that means he's going to have to manage all of them. So he has to believe that there are other potential Tanners out there and he's got to multiply himself. So, but the, the trick is how do we find the people that have the competency and the want to, to be multiplied. And then how do we develop people like that? Cause Tanner was green, but he obviously had the competency. He obviously had the attitude. So where did you find Tanner? Uh, I know you said he came from another D one. Yep. What did you see in, in him specifically? Like, what did you particularly look for? And then what was the beginning of that relationship? I know you said, you know, focus on people, but like, what was the training regimen like, or what are some things you had to do, whether it was reading or whatever you had to do to develop them? Sure. So, uh, you know, I mean, I, I really look for a couple things, and, and number one is character, right? And and I look for that character, and I look for, for don't quit, right? And um, because that's what happened, right? So my family was in this business, and I can tell you that, you know, we, we uh, 24-Hour Fitness came to Boise. Mm-hmm. And then they exited a little while later. So we, we had, um, but you've got to have that don't quit mentality. So I always look for that. Mm-hmm. And then I tell everybody that comes to work for me, and they, they don't really believe me, but I always tell them this, that you've got to be a little weird to work with me. Yeah. <laughs> you really do. And, and here's the thing. Weird people are interesting. Mm-hmm. And interesting people attract people. Um, I don't want robots. In fact, if you're a robot, uh, and we've had a couple robots they never work out. Yeah. Right. So they hit a ceiling too quickly. Right. And it's not that high. Yeah. I mean, and that's the that's the the stretch here is to be able to, and you mentioned it, right? So uh, someone like Tanner, who is a top performer, he has to believe that there are other people out there that can be even better than him. Mm-hmm. Right. And I and I believe, uh, you know, that's what I've always looked for is people that are better than me. Mm-hmm. Um, he can run that studio way better than I can. Uh, and but that's why he's there. And yeah, that's why he's doing it. Yeah. So training and development is is a big piece of the puzzle. But I will say this: the the, the biggest the biggest thing that we do is commit. And so I've seen a lot of gym owners in my in my career that have said, "All right, we're going to hire this person. We'll see if they work out." And right? then they step away. They step and away. And then they complain. Yep. Or they wa- or they oh geez they washed out they 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 didn't mm-hmm. make it. What we do is not only give everybody the tools, but the opportunity. Yeah. You don't have to earn your way in. We want you to be part of that team. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's funny, like, I, uh, I, I coach basketball. I'm 23 seasons in coaching basketball. I've coached four or five seasons, five seasons of soccer, uh, t-ball, about three, four seasons. So I've seen parents leave their children. And you see, you know, really great leaders, type, all good parents generally, right? They all love their kids and they do their best for their kids. But some of them are just better leaders than others. And you see parents step on the, on the field with their kid that's never played before or on the court with their kid that's never played before. Their kid will take a shot, he'll miss, and he'll go, and this, this is in a specific story. Come on, man, you can make that. So kid goes, shoots again, misses again come on, you can make this go. Just focus. Make sure your hands lined up. So he's telling the kid what to do. So after about five misses in a row, I could tell the kid's getting a little discouraged. So I kind of step in because I was working with another kid and I, I go, hey, dad, shoot it. So he goes, oh, I haven't played in years. I go, oh, neither has he. Shoot it. <laughs> <laughs> he shoots it and he airballs it. I go, dad, you can make that. Come on, shoot the ball. And he starts laughing. And he, and he shoot. Now, I already had a rapport with him. It wasn't cold, right? Sure. He goes, shoots it again, and he misses. And I go, look, you've played way more than him. It's hard to make five shots in a row. It's hard to make two out of five shots. It's hard to make one out of five shots if you're seven or eight years old. Let him do his thing. Let him miss. It's okay. Step back, but you got to let him practice. I tell you that because I see a lot of the th- same things with studio managers. They bring the studio manager in and they haven't done what the studio manager has done. They haven't put in the training hours to learn sales, to learn uh, management. They haven't read books on leadership or development. Um, And then they they bring this leader in 
this person that's in a leader role and they say, okay, here's what I need you to do. And they set the standards of what they need and then they step away. And when they don't make the sales, come on, you've got to get these sales up. You got, you got to make sales. You got to get these sales. Basically what they haven't ever done. And they get on them, they get on them and then they complain about them. And I've done this on the studio side too. You take the phones for a little while. You go make the sales. And they have a hard time. You've got to be able to train your people. And you've also got to have patience with your people in the very beginning as well because it's a new thing. They don't know your business like you know your business. They don't know the customer issues like you know your customer issues or the people that come in. And you know why those kids get a membership. You know what the parents, what triggers them by now. The new manager that came from Orange Theory or something else may not know that. So I think when you're bringing in a new manager, number one, you've got to understand leadership and management at a decent level because how else are you going to develop this person into something else? You've been man- How long have, have you been a manager for prior to putting Tanner in a position? Not necessarily D1, but in your life. Oh, I, you know, I, I came back to a, a, an executive role in 1999. So however many years that is. 20 and, years. Yeah. 21 years, 22 years. Yeah. And you read books on leadership before or management or anything like that? Oh, absolutely. I, you know, I'm... It's something I'm passionate about, right? You know, I'm right now, right now I'm reading uh, The Talent War. Now, um, now, I want to stop there. We're going to ask you about Talent War, but for everyone watching and listening, if you go, I don't need to read, I know I'm a good leader. This guy's been a leader for 21 years, got a club that's doing 106,000, has got an incredible leader, probably the best studio manager I've seen in the space so far. Honestly, you probably have the best studio manager I currently work with. We work with a lot of them. If not, he's top 5%, Okay. So you've developed a really good leader. If you aren't get, if you don't have a club that's doing 106 grand per month, if you don't have a leader that you're excited about and impressed with, and he's running the business while you're not, well then, what makes you think that he sh- still should read books on leadership management and you shouldn't? A guy that what's a quote? Uh, a person that can read and doesn't has no advantage over the person that can't read. Okay. So now tell me about this book. So Talent War, and I'm and I'm just on the plane this morning, was uh, got into like the fifth or sixth chapter. It's written by a couple of special forces guys, and they and they talk about and they talk about how the special forces selects people, mm-hmm. and and I'm fascinated by it. I have, I have a number of friends in that space that have that have come out of that space, and and I always thought I think we probably all think you know we watch the movies and and you know to join the seals you go in and they and they you know put you through hell week and you ring the bell and then you're out right. And, and that's how they find those people. And, and I was fascinated to find out that, that physical characteristics are not the most important thing. Character is the most important thing. In the Navy SEAL. It, as a matter of fact, when you, when you go in, there's a minimum. Uh, there's a, and I just read it this morning. There's a minimum. You have to be able to do 11 pull-ups to join the Special Forces. <laughs> and doing 20 makes no difference. There's yeah. a minimum. Wow. And, and what, it, what it tells me is the same thing that, that I've been striving to do, but now I can sort of, the other thing that I like when you read books is you get to verbalize, right? You use somebody else's words because yeah. um, it makes sense to you, is that they commit to character, right? And they hire character over industry experience. And that also was a little bit fascinating to me because the fitness business from since I was you know, new into this industry, it is, you need two things. You need a degree in kinesiology and you need experience and that'll get you hired Mm -hmm. and you need both. Right. And, and so we take, I take, and and we as a team take chances on people that, that come from the outside. We're not trying to hire those industry veterans and insiders. That doesn't mean we won't look at them, but we look for something different. We look for excitement, especially in that scholastic space, right? You know, you can't take somebody that doesn't like kids and have them be effective with mm-hmm. your youth athletes. Yeah, it will make sense. Yeah. He'll get annoyed, frustrated, behave differently. Yeah. And when we talk about, we talk about, you know, talent development, uh, you, you sort of triggered a thing that, you know, you ask, you know, what was the training regimen for Tanner like? So he showed up day one, right, and moved up from Texas, and day one he had nine pages. Of notes? Of notes and ideas. And on those pages, at least four ideas on every page. Wow. Now, how many of them worked? Okay, a lot of them didn't work. But the important thing that for me, and and I and I had to take a step back, and he was so excited, and I had to remind myself that I've got to let people try stuff. Um, and he would tell you if he was here that we tried stuff, and it didn't work. Mm-hmm. Some of that stuff didn't work. A lot of it didn't work. But it allowed me to create trust that he could try something. It might not work. It might fail. We might spend money on it. 
But as long as we realized that and were able to shift, it created that trust factor with us. As long as he doesn't create that stubborn pride, like I got to keep this going because it's my idea. As long as he can say, you know what? We tested it, it didn't work, let's move on. Then we're good. Yep. I've struggled with that in the past. It's tough, you know, and, and, and I've, you know, obviously it's an important thing in leadership and I, I do it, I know I do it regularly where a probably popular phrase I have is, yeah, go ahead and do it. Go, go ahead and do it. That's the problem. How many times do I say to okay, yeah, go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. You know, we'll, she'll, she'll know if it didn't work. But there's a lot of times where the the guy that's been running this company, you know, for as, as a solo person for a few years prior, before we started really hiring people, I was the only one that like, you know, was doing it. So I had to get myself out of a habit and, and, and it was worth it once I did, but it, it's a struggle. So for everyone listening and watching, I think what he says, one of the most important things you take away from the episode is you got a team of people even if you know the idea, well, even if you believe, because you never really know, even if you believe the idea probably isn't going to work, at worst, let them test it and give them your insight. I mean, if you do like in a particular idea, say, why don't we test two things and see how that works? Yeah. Um, with Tanner, um, you've got, do you have any other people in leadership position or is he the only leader? He's, he's the only uh, leader in, in that club right now. Um, we, are, we are actively seeking um, people to, to help grow and expand the organization. And, and, and so that's... Because you're opening up more clubs too, right? We are, absolutely, yeah. What's your goal? Uh, so my original goal was 10, um, but after the past year and the success that we've had, mm -hmm. uh, uh, 20 wow. within the next three years. That's awesome. That's awesome. So one thing I want to talk about is sales and the emphasis that you put on sales. How important is it to you in the business that your team really understands and embraces it? So sales in the fitness space is, is the most important thing, in my opinion. Um, and, and I'm not just saying that because I'm an old school sales guy and I'm a, and I'm a, a guy that likes to study sales and, uh, and use the Ben Franklin clothes whenever I get a chance. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but honestly, the, the thing that, that, is difficult about fitness is that it's hard. Okay, so so think about this. So I'm going to invite you in, uh, and you haven't worked out for a while. Okay, mm -hmm. we're going to do a workout. Um, if you haven't worked out for a while, it's going to hurt, right? And um, you're probably going to sweat, and uh, that'll be uncomfortable, and maybe you'll smell a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we're going to sit in an office, and you're going to be out of breath. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you that if you give me money that you can come and do that a lot, <laughs> okay? So, Perspective, huh? <laughs> so think about that, right? So think about um, how important it is to be um, someone that can be empathetic with those people. And that's mm -hmm. one of the hardest things for me to teach salespeople. And I, I, I'm not teaching it. Um, I'm just trying to draw it out of them. And frankly, um, if you don't have that empathetic side, you will not be good at sales, right? Um, and, and it's important for us to realize that, that people are all in a different spot. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so sales is all important and it's, it's important because we have to be persuasive because what we do is not easy, right? Being fit, being an athlete, being where you want to be with your body is not easy. Mm -hmm. Um, nutrition, exercise, all those kinds of things. People want to know that we can lead them there. Yeah. But they also want to know that we're going to encourage them. Okay, so they don't come for the drill sergeant. Some people do. You know, there there are there are people that love that that, that want to be pushed over the top, mm -hmm. right? But there are very few. Other people want us to listen to their goals, to tell them that they can achieve it, and that we're going to be there to help, mm -hmm. right? So, so that is that a tradi is that traditional sales? Mm, I don't necessarily think it's traditional sales, not in the industry at least, right? But it's yeah. the be in my opinion, it's the best way to do it because. The other thing that I tell people is you'll never be able to make someone do anything that they don't want to do. Mm -hmm. You can't do it. You can't do it. You could even sign their name on that contract in front of them, they walk out the door and cancel it. So unless they want to do it, you can't make them. Yeah. You know, we, we talked about that in a group coaching call last Thursday. Uh, somebody came in prepared and said, hey, Mike, I want you to help us overcome these three objections. And the obje overcoming objections is always a tricky thing um, for some people to understand, at least my philosophy on it, because I feel like it depends on, is that objection true or not? Because some objections are true. 
you know, like, hey, I've got a scheduling conflict. That could be BS. You know, hey, my schedule's too tight. It could be BS. It could be the way that they get out of it. Or it could be real. We have to understand first, is it real? Like, okay, break down to be the schedule. But the example I gave is, well, look, if a person tells you, I need to think about it, the person tells you, I don't know, it looks like it's too much money, or I have talked to my husband or any of those, and if you overcome an objection and they give you another objection that seems to be unrelated to the first one, this person doesn't want to do this. And the example I gave is if if you if, you, if girl goes on a date with a guy, and at the end of the date, uh, the, the guy didn't really impress her, she wasn't really having a good time, but he thinks she was because she stayed through the whole dinner and, you know, she ate everything and she laughed at his jokes and stuff like that. And at the end, when he goes, hey, what do you think about, you know, us doing this again Thursday? And then she goes, oh, you know, I got finals this week. It's really hard. And he goes, oh, well, actually, wh- what subject are you working on? Math. I'm terrible. At math. I'm actually a math tutor. I, can, I, I help people with this. Yeah, I just study better on my own. You know, I do better. <laughs> Okay, well, maybe we'll do it the week after that. Yeah, I've got family coming to town. I've, I haven't seen him in like seven years. I really want to give him my full attention. Okay, let's, let's be real. The girl that likes the boy will not sleep during finals to go hang out with him and study. She'll absolutely have him as a tutor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and she'll, she'll find a way to get away from the family because she doesn't want to be with the family for seven straight days, 24 hours. So it's one objection after another after another because the first one didn't work. At this point, what he's hoping to do is trap her into a place where she has to say yeah. And I think in sales, a lot of people do the same thing. They find a way to like trap you into saying yes. Like, I gotcha. Now you have nowhere to go. And well, you shouldn't be trapping them into getting there. You, sh- you wouldn't get the objection if you would have done the date right if from the very beginning. Because the guy, the guy that thinks he lost her at the ask needs to know he lost her at the drinks. He right. lost her at the appetizer. And a lot of people don't respect the sales process all the way from the very beginning. When the person first walked in the door, or even the first phone call, how did they feel? How, you know, how, did they want to buy before they even took the workout? If you can get the person to go, this is amazing, this is cool. I wanna, before I even do my workout, I'm already interested. I'm still going to do the workout, but I'm already intrigued, intrigued. By the time you get to the end, it doesn't really matter how you ask them. They just want to get in. It's the same thing with the, the girl. The guy could stutter the whole way through. Do you, do you think maybe we did uh, Thursday. He could stutter, and she'll she'll find it cute. Be like, yeah, Thursday's great. She'll, she'll think it's funny. It's cute. So it's not so much about overcoming each other. If, if if the guy had something to work on, if you said, hey, give me one thing to work on to make sure I don't get that many no's when I ask for a Thursday date, don't work on how to overcome objections. Work on how to make the date better. If you can work on making the date better, you probably won't have an objection. She might even ask you just like with the price. Yep. How many people in a sales presentation go, how much does this cost? I'd love to do this before you even pitch them, right? So how do we make the sales presentation better? The whole process leading up to the price presentation so that when you get to the end, you don't have to be so great at overcoming objections. still be good at them because some of them are real. But well, more often they're, they're smoke screens. You know, in, in, in this industry, we have spent so much time on that objection, right? I mean, and, and that's the old school, you know, the, the way that, that I was taught to sell. And I, by the way, I, I, I rejected that idea out of the gate, right? It, to me, it just didn't feel right. But, the, you know, you, you come in the door, you get that firm handshake, and we do the glory tour. And if they ask about price, you tell them that you'll tell them later. And if they ask about price again, you tell them that you'll tell them in just a little bit. And if mm-hmm. they ask about price a third time, you sit them down and you give them the full presentation. Right. Right. And that's, and that's the way we used to do things. Um, and that's the way some organizations still do it. Mm-hmm. In a higher value, higher ticket studio environment like we have, where we want not just to have this person try it, we want them to be successful, we want them to come back, we want them to refer their friends. We want buy them more. To buy themselves. more, right. bring their family. We have got to start the minute we, we greet them. Yep. And on the phone. Right or even on social media, that's the that's a learning thing for me is is how how can you be friendly on social media? How are you friendly with the text message? Right, that's not that's not something that I grew up with in my generation, yeah. um, but we've got to learn it. Or, or I, in my case, I try to find people that have it. Right, how is it not just a transactional te- text? Like I see a lot of people text where it's like, hey, this is blah 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 from blah 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 Jim. Just wanted to see if you're still interested in coming in. If they were still interested, they would have got the. They would have texted you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're not like I really hope she texts me so I can tell her I'm interested. <laughs> so there's a, there's got to be a, a unique strategy, and a lot of people just I check the box. No one's calling me back. Right. Right. Doesn't. Yeah, I went through my leads for the day. 
moving moving on moving on so yeah no I, I I completely agree it's changing it's changing the way we interact with people not just in the gym industry but with everything else yeah one last thing I want to touch on before we uh, before we get in because a guy that that solved a big problem like you seventy dollars is a big problem right um, the PPP was a big solution and so you said I became Oh, uh, well, I said wizard. You said I became an expert. I don't know. You, Subject matter expert. Subject matter expert. <laughs> okay. At the PPP, you probably spent, how many hours did you say you spent on learning all the ins and outs of the PPP to make sure you did it right? And calls with the bankers and all that stuff. Oh, I, over 100. 100 hours, yeah. right? On something that literally existed for maybe 108 hours. <laughs> right. It was barely around. So, so you're, you're talking, you spent 100 hours on a big solution to solve a big problem. Jim Rohn is a business philosopher. He's wrote a couple really great sales books. You ever heard of Jim Rohn before? Yep. Love the guy. And one quote that he says, and I might chop it up, but the overall arching thing is, uh, don't solve big problems with small solutions or don't spend major time on minor things. Don't spend minor time on major things. You spent major time on a major thing. There was a major problem. I need a major solution. I'm gonna spend major time and effort on learning it so that I can solve my major problem. But what I see in this industry too much is you got people that have major problems. And if you ask them, what's the biggest problem you got in your business right now? Sometimes even they have a hard time even are like thinking about it. They, it's not even at the top of their mind. You say, look, what's the one, biggest one? If you had it and you knew what it was and it would make the biggest financial impact positively on you if you got it fixed, got it to a nine or a 10, what's the big problem? So let's say they say sales or attrition or whatever. When I ask the follow-up, I go, hey, well, what are you doing to fix it? Not major effort. Right. They're spending more effort on the other things that have minor result. Uh, making the class schedule look better, posting interesting memes on social media and finding ways to send like really pretty things or whatever. Uh, maybe they're fixing the retail area. Not that those things aren't good to do, but it doesn't have the, the same financial impact on improving the attrition from 10% to 4%. Does that the same financial impact on getting your closing rate from 7% to 40%? If it doesn't, why aren't we taking all of that time and putting it onto this one problem, solve it, and move on? You did that with the PPP. What would you say right now is the major problem in your business or opportunity? Sometimes there's not a major problem. Sometimes there's a major opportunity. What's the biggest problem or opportunity right now, and, and how are you working on it? So, uh, again, back to, you know... My opinion of everything that that happens in this business is people, mm -hmm. and and so I'm looking as, as as I mentioned, I've got a pretty lofty goal to put you know 20 facilities in. Um, I need people. I need people committed. I need people that that buy into what we're doing, um, and I need and I need people in different geographic locations. Right. That's the other thing is, um, you know, I, I ran multi-site, but they were all within 45 minutes of each other, um, and and we're looking at expanding. You know, in the into opportunities and so i've got to have people because one of the things we did with that ppp money is we we did have a couple things that were that were that were big broken buckets mm -hmm. okay and and our in our in our lead generation of marketing was one of those and so um we took a portion of that ppp money and allocated it uh and then we had to learn how to do that right and and we went through um, a number of exercises again, and I and I failed. Um, I've, I've failed a number of times on that, but I was committed enough not just not just to learn, but I was committed enough financially. And now that I had those resources, I could allocate them. Right, I wasn't scrambling to make mm -hmm. payroll, um, and, and and it and it's worked. And that's where we're going. And that's allowed us um, now that we have those things in place to continue to to drive it forward, but add people to our team. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm constantly out there. Uh, again, I know you are because that's why you're here. <laughs> you're in Arizona looking for possible opportunities, right? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So that's got your attention right now. Oh, yeah. That's where most of your attention's at. What would you say Tanner, as your general manager, what do you say his attention's mostly on right now? So right now, his attention is on replicating himself. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, is he's now... Uh, so we're not, by the way, even though 106 is great, we're not satisfied with that. Where are you going? Uh, I truly believe we can be over 150. Um, okay. But to do that, here's the thing. So so he's, you know, for us to, to get to that number, and he's got a great closing percentage, I think it's 86, by the way. On shows? 
on shows. That's amazing. Yeah, he does a great job there. But here's what we've got to do. We've got another team out in front that, especially during primetime, because we're st studio business is still primetime, mm -hmm. right? It's still 4 to 7 p.m., um, and, and we have six, seven guests at the same time. He can't see them all mm -hmm. together. And so training our people to be able to close and present and, and is the only way we're going to drive that number because I can't clone him. I would like to, right? And uh, he's got, he's got two little boys, but they're very young right now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's close we can get. <laughs> so, but, uh, so we've got to, um, we've got to teach our people so that we can continue to drive that up. Got it. Now I, I know you guys have been a part of the loud rumor program for a little while as well. And Tanner, I got to tell you is, an incredible coachable student um, always comes in with a positive attitude, holds himself accountable more than I could even hold him accountable, honestly, because he, he usually holds himself accountable before I can even say anything to him. And he's good at holding other people accountable. I've noticed as well, at least in, in our program, which is pretty cool. Um, he says he goes through the training quite a bit as he started putting his people through some of the training. He's, he's given them pieces, right? Okay. And, and I will say that he was excited, um, you know, when, when we invested in that program to, to dive right in mm -hmm. and, and it, and it really opened a lot of things up for him. Um, there were resources that were available and he's making those available to his team. One of the things that I coach him with is that, that not everybody is going to spend five hours of their day on, a, on the podcast. Right. Okay. Let's, let's break it up into some right. pieces, um, and then let them apply it. Right? Let them apply some of those things that they're learning. And, and that's been good. It's been very effective. It's helped, it's helped our phone skills. It's helped, again, our communication skills. Mm -hmm. But I think the most important thing is it's helped create an awareness. Okay? When, when you show up to work and, and you're just going to you know, call a couple leads or you're going to do this or that and you're not completely focused on the total outcome, mm -hmm. then you just show up to work and sort of kind of do your job. Yeah. Right? And people can feel that. If you're truly invested in the customer and you want them to succeed, they feel that. Yeah. You can see it walking around. It's, it's, a, it's a level of engagement. The eyes are wider. Uh, smile just seems to be kind of on. Yeah. And yeah, when people are just kind of going through the motions, it, it's very identifiable. Awesome. Sean, you've done some incredible things uh, in, in your business and in the businesses that you've had. And uh, it sounds like you're about to do even more incredible things. 20 locations in three years is an incredible goal. 150,000 in one location is an incredible goal. Uh, I'm excited to continue following your journey and that when you hit 150 or even get location two or three up, I'd like to invite you to come back. Great. Honestly, I might even like to have Tanner on the show. I think he'd be good. He would love it. Yeah? <laughs> I have to find a way to get Tanner on. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much for being on the show. For everybody watching, listening, thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time.